So our final speaker of this session, um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Roxana Correas. She did her PhD at UC Riverside in environmental toxicology and now is a postdoc at UC Berkeley where she's gonna tell us today about leveraging the BioCorona interface to enhance agricultural, agricultural nanobiotechnology. So hi everybody, um, I just want to start off and say thank you for being here and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm really happy to be talking a little bit about the research that I've been um, starting at Berkeley um, and hope hopefully convince you <clears throat> that this is interesting. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about my trajectory um, into academia. So I started off at CSUN, uh, which is a Cal State uh, in Northridge. Um, I was I participated in this program called the NIH RISE program. Um, so through that opportunity, I got experience in a research lab. Um, so I looked at, well, I helped look at <laughs> RAD1, RAD10 protein complex recruitment in double strand breaks. Um, and I really liked the protein aspect of it and um, didn't like so much the DNA work at that time. And I think that now <laughs> as a PhD, I, I, I understand how important the DNA work is. But anyways, that's just, just a little, Tidbit. But um, I then did a like a REU type uh, thing with the Forest Service, and so I got some environmental exposure and um, basically making maps of invasive species, and that was really cool. Um, so I really liked both components. Um, and during my time at CSUN, I got exposed to nanotechnology, and I really wanted to look at that more. Um, so at Riverside, I did a lot of toxicological assessment, assessments of engineered nanomaterials and their biocoronas, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and I'm trying to follow that up now in, in plants. So um, to get started, I want to talk a little bit about um, the burdens of agriculture. So um, it's estimated that within 30 years, uh, population will rise or increase by 3 billion people, uh, which is immense. Um, and so there's this huge demand um, to increase food production. But unfortunately, that will affect our natural resources, um, particularly groundwater, deforestation, or land use. Um, so there's a really critical need for sustainable options. Um, and one of those options may be uh, nanotechnology. And so while there's been many formulations of nanomaterials, um, nanosensors, nanopesticides, nanonutrients, I really want to focus on the genetic component of nanotechnology, how we can functionalize nanomaterials with nucleic acids, proteins also, um, introduce those into plants and hopefully see um, a transgenic response or a transient expression. Um, so when we think about nanoparticles and how they enter into plants, we have to think, take into consideration um, uh, their leaf and tissue morphology, but also the cellular aspect. So under the leaf of a uh, of a plant, um, there are stomatas, which have a rough opening, or they're roughly about 20 to 70 microns, and that really uh, varies depending on the species. Um, but plants um, have a very thick cell wall composed of cellulose and lignin, um, and essentially they're quite difficult to penetrate um, or introduce. For example, if you put a little droplet of a nanoparticle solution, it doesn't necessarily make its way into the leaf tissue. So how can we introduce these nanomaterials in a more efficient way um, is very critical. Um, and so we want to bypass this cell wall layer um, and make our way into um, actual plant cells with their nuclei. Um, and so um, factors to consider are currently in the literature, it seems that nanoparticles that are below 50 nanometers in size are able to make their way into uh, plant cells. Um, uh, and bypass this um, cell wall layer. Um, so one of these really cool candidates for um, introducing genetic material into plants are single wall carbon nanotubes. Um, they are um, high aspect ratio material, so they have a really small diameter, 
anywhere between 0.5 to 2.5 nanometers in diameter. Um, and then lengthwise, they're quite large. Um, so um, we can think about this in terms of how they make their way into the leaf tissue, uh, right? So they can um, potentially, it, it seems like they would enter more preferentially if they are introduced more like a needle. Um, and so we actually inject these into plant cells. Um, and the interesting thing about nanotubes is that they have a really strong intrinsic uh, near infrared uh, fluorescence. And so when they're introduced into biological tissues, it's really, um, it's easier to image them uh, because of this uh, phenomenon. And within nanotubes, so this is just one type of nanomaterial, um, but you can roll up this nanotube in 11 different types of conformations. Um, so nanomaterials are really amazing in the fact that one core material can have so many different aspects to it. Um, and even, for example, here, the chirality has changed. Um, but size also has an influence. Surface chemistry has an influence on how these nanomaterials engage with biomolecules and in uh, cells. And one last thing that I want to touch upon with these swints um, is that they um, are able to absorb these nucleic acids, particularly RNA, um, and protect RNA from degradation. So I'm sure we all are, are all familiar with the fact that RNA is very easy to degrade. Um, so this is really, really phenomenal. Um, and so I want to just touch a little bit upon um, some of the work that was done by a previous grad student in um, the Landry Lab. Um, Gosday, she's now at Caltech doing really cool stuff with tomato plants. Um, but the idea here was that she took some nanotubes and she um, essentially um, prepared them so that they are wrapped with uh, single-stranded RNA, um, that when it comes together, um, it's able to form double-stranded RNA that can uh, combine with gene silencing complexes for post-transcriptional um, gene silencing. Um, the issue with um, these nanotubes is that once they're wrapped with a type of biomolecule, it's very difficult for them to desorb, uh, especially in an aqueous environment. Um, they don't like to be in this really aqueous environment. Um, so it's not, it's not very favorable uh, for these uh, nucleic acids to desorb from the surface of these tubes. But in the presence of biomolecules, or in the presence of these really complex um, fluids, um, these uh, nucleic acids are able to desorb, um, and we see adsorption of other biomolecules on the surface of the nanotube um, with a higher affinity to the surface of the nanotube. And so the, the issue, the, what she was able to see was that um, through this process of delivering these nucleic acids into a um, transgenic um, mutant of tobacco, um, she was able to see that the, the swints are able to deliver this uh, these materials into the cell, into the plant cells, and efficiently silence um, this GFP expression, um, which is really cool. Like I really was like, wow. <laughs> um, but to follow up. Um, I'm not necessarily interested in this process. I'm more interested in what happens at this level, which is a little niche. <laughs> but um, what what are, what are the biomolecules that absorb onto this carbon nanotube, and essentially what um, what happens to this nanotube in plant cells, right? So this is really cool. Like this is awesome, and hopefully we get to a point where this expression is really stable and um, can be passed on to generation from generation to the generation. Um, but the issue I think here is what happens to these carbon nanotubes? Do they degrade in the plant cells? Um, where do they end up being stored, um, or can they be actually be removed? Um, so those are things that I'm really interested, in. and hopefully by studying this these biomolecules, uh, we can answer those questions. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about the biocorona, right? So this is the these absorption of these lipids and proteins and nucleic acids on these materials. Um, the really cool thing about the, the this um, phenomenon is that there are so many studies in human cells that show that this biological um, identity on this inorganic particle um, can drive so many downstream processes. Um, and within plants, it's really unknown, um, which I think is really, really fascinating to me. There's so many, there's so much potential to under, like try and understand. Um, but we know that from the literature that um, 
these biomolecules will interact not only with cell receptors. Um, I think the, the, the thing here is that these biomolecules are very diverse. And so there's many receptors that can be interacting with many different proteins and many different lipids um, and other biomolecules on the surface of this nanomaterial. But there's also this uh, group of proteins inside the cell that are also interacting that we don't really understand um, or fully understand at this moment. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about like uh, some of the work that I've done with biocorona um, analysis um, and how um, we've been able to sort of correlate that with biological phenomenon. So this was one of the projects that I was able to uh, work on during my uh, graduate work. Um, so the idea here is that these nanoparticles undergo this digestion system. Um, it's simulated. And the idea is that these nanoparticles are then introduced um, into a gut model. And the gut model, essentially, these nanoparticles will pass through this first layer of cells, make their way through the trans wall membrane. Um, and essentially, uh, we should see the nanoparticles um, in the um, basolateral section of this um, well. And so um, we observed that there were um, a lot of free fatty acids in this lower layer. Um, and we were really curious as to why that was happening with these plastic nanoparticles. Um, and the idea here is that using um, proteomics and lipidomics, we can determine what species are on the surface of these nanomaterials and try to bridge um, what those species may be, what species are uh, potentially um, causing these um, downstream effects. Right? So one of the things that we found was that there was a high abundance of lipase and a really high abundance of traceoglycerides on the surface of these particles. And that kind of makes sense because you're plastic, so lipids, plastics, there might be some um, hydrophobic um, tendency for each of these material, for each of these components to come together. Um, but also the fact that we saw that the abundance of these species were um, dramatically large um, as compared to, for example, a regular lipid droplet. Um, so, um, I think the biocorona has a lot of potential for um, not only for um, eukaryotic systems or like mammalian systems, but also um, for plants. And so um, I just want to touch upon the hypothesis that, it we're, that I'm currently working on, which is trying to understand what biocorona constituents um, or what um, protein and lipid constituents stick to the surfaces of these um, gene delivering nanoparticles. Um, but also, what hap can we compare the profile of these particles without the um, nucleic acid component? Um, and essentially use the biocorona to determine whether or not we can also identify biomarkers of stress in plants. Um, and so we can infect the plants with pathogens or uh, uh, place the plants in, uh, for example, salt, salt conditions that are um, triggering of stress. Um, and again, identify those biomarkers. So it's um, definitely a, wor a works in the, co uh, it's coming. <laughs> um, uh, so here I just want to show this gel. This is some of the very preliminary data that we've been able to collect. So we have a control. We also have our um, pathogen infected plant control as well. There's, uh, it seems like no differences, right? Apart from like some nanoparticles are able to um, enrich in certain conditions, depending on their surface chemistry as well. Um, and so from this gel, we're not able to really determine anything unless we p plug this into um, ImageJ and um, essentially um, plot the densiometric or plot the density of each of these gels. Um, so, or the gel bands. <laughs> um, so the issue here is that, um, or the phenomenon here that we're observing is that uh, we can normalize the signals from the bands that have the enriched proteins on the nanoparticle surface. Um, and we can normalize with our control so that we can see events where the protein, um, this protein band, for example, might, may be depleted or the, in cases where the uh, protein band may be highly enriched compared to the control. So um, what this suggests is that there's proteins that are probably of really low abundance in this biological matrix um, that we can enrich and identify, um, but also within the pathogenic or the pathogen infected plant we see uh, very different um, spectra. Um, so there's a lot of potential here. We're in the works of trying to identify what these species are, right? Because these are just 
gels, right? The test, what, what are these proteins, right? So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper, hopefully in the future, and um, hopefully be able to present that to you in the future. Um, so um, I think one thing that I really wanna emphasize is that like serum, um, right, which has a really high abundance of albumin in its, in, in its uh, a really high abundance of albumin, um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, plant fluid actually has a really high abundance of this protein called rubisco. Um, so that in itself real, will absorb really strongly to the nanotubes or the nanoparticles we're working with. Um, so um, we're trying to mitigate that, but also we also realize that there will be low abundant proteins that absorb onto these materials. So we're, we're just definitely really, I'm definitely really excited to see what these proteins are and what we can correlate them with in, in terms of like what is occurring in terms of the stressors that we're inducing in them. Um, so in terms of like future work, um, I think there's a lot of potential um, to look at um, differences between multi versus single protein corona binding. So a lot of the literature that we, uh, that is available on biocorona um, is, um, you know, they characterize the corona and identify like hundreds and hundreds of proteins that stick to this material um, and they pick one and it's usually albumin. Right? And then they go, okay, well, let's measure the binding kinetics and can we desorb that protein and how does that affect the cargo load? That's great. But the idea is that it's not just albumin that sticks to these particles. So um, trying to develop assays that look at multi-protein uh, corona binding um, and then downstream biological effects, um, but also trying to identify what these proteins are um, on the in, inside the cell is really important. Um, and again, the main goal is engineering better materials. Um, so we know that, uh, well, nobody wants a nanotube inside of their body. I don't want a nanotube inside of my body. Um, but for example, these more biologically relevant um, materials um, are worthwhile to look at their biocorona formation. And I think that that's also really understudied. Um, so there's a lot of um, potential with biocorona analysis. Um, so with that, I just want to thank my, my uh, advisor, Professor Marquita Landry, um, and also Elizabeth, who's a wonderful grad student, and Nikita, an undergrad, who have been really helpful with like helping me grow plants for the first time in my life. <laughs> so, and also thank you to all of you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, okay, how do you make a Swint. Um, so that's a really good question. So the swints that you saw, like all those beautiful different colors, that's like ideal. Right? Okay. So when you um, make swints, you can you can exfoliate um, like a carbon source, like for example a lead pencil, uh -huh. and get a really thin layer of graphene. Um, exfoliate that longer so that it rolls up. Um, and the idea is that um, there's a, a mixture of all of these different types of chiromoieties of the um, uh, single wall nanotubes. Um, so we can use chromatography to separate okay. out each species. And you don't have, you kind of alluded to this, you, there's no way to like get them out of the organism once you put them in or? In, in humans, so in humans, they, well not humans, but human cells, <laughs> um, there's this idea that um, if the material gets coated with biomolecules, it's harder for it to degrade. Um, but if it's coated with certain types of polymers or surfactants, um, that may help it degrade, right? Um, and so in plants though, we don't really know what happens. A lot of these studies that look at like using this, these materials to introduce biomolecules into plants don't really follow up with like yeah. what happens after. Okay, very cool. Oh, that was a great talk, and you made a big, oh, back here, sorry. <laughs> you made it really clear how powerful these materials can be, and there's so many applications in medicine and other things, but there's also a downside, right, with nanoparticles and environmental contamination, and there's a lot of concern there. So I was wondering if moving forward, that's going to be something you're looking at, or not really? Um, yes and no. I feel like, um, <laughs> based on like the, the work I did during my PhD, I feel like it's really um, questionable, um, like these toxicological assessments, 
So for example, if I prepare swims and have all these like different, um, this broad collection, um, another lab could try and prepare them the same way and they come out completely different. Um, so it's hard to say whether or not the, the particles that I've found toxic and they found non-toxic are, like, it's, it's really up for debate. But I think that like, um, it's something to consider, right? Like titanium dioxide was recently found as really bad, right? It's been in our food forever um, and um, it's still in our food. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's worth looking into, but me, myself, I, I kind of want to stray away from oh, okay. <laughs> toxicological, yeah. Interesting talk. Uh, uh, I know nothing about bio nanotechnology, but uh, like when you oh, were no. mentioning about like uh, reducing the uh, burden for the plants, like uh, to increase the plant production. So I was thinking like a uh, can nanobiotechnology could be applied to the field crops as well, or it should be uh, or only in the lab in the where you are growing where, where you are growing plants in the very controlled condition and. Mm -hmm. Do you know there is any uh, difference in the efficacy of these uh, nano bioparticles when you apply to the plant in the lab condition, or co control condition versus the field condition? Right. Um, those are really wonderful questions. Um, so I actually spoke with um, one of our collaborators. Her name is Nina Mitter. Um, she does really amazing work with clay nanomaterials. And what's really cool about clay is that it's natural, like it's in our environment, um, and it's able to degrade um, once it's applied on plants. And so she's been able to actually put that out in the field. And so in the field, they're exposed to sun and rain and a bunch of conditions that can help them degrade or um, not. <laughs> um, but she's been able to see that these materials are able to degrade and it, it's really wonderful. For carbon nanotubes, I think it might be a little bit more difficult to actually see them being applied in the field, um, just because, again, toxic toxicity, right? Like some people say that these carbon nanotubes are safe. Some people say that they're really bad. Um, so it's a lot of conflict with some materials. Others are a little bit more um, like biologically friendly. So it can vary. Okay, I think we have a, a couple more questions. You should talk to Roxana after the session. <laughs> Thank you very much.